So, once you've published your video to YouTube, you're done, right? You can sit back and relax. No, not in the slightest. In fact, some of the things you do after the video goes live can be the most important. Let's start with comments and let me ask you this question. As a percentage, how many comments do you read and reply to in the first 24 hours of a video's life? For vidIQ, I would say we read about 50% of them and reply to 25% of those comments, purely because of the sheer volume that we get these days. But irrespective of channel size, this is a habit you can and should be getting into, checking the comments on your videos a few hours after they go live. Now, there's a very clear reason for this. Your first comments usually come from your most loyal supporters and fans who are taking time out of their day to put you first. And not only are they prioritizing their time to watch your content, they have enough emotional investment to engage with it as well. This is one of the many signals of viewer satisfaction that YouTube's recommendation system is really into. And beyond any notion of the YouTube algorithm, this is your opportunity to build relationships with your community. And so beyond just reading the comments, there are three ways you can engage with your viewers through the comments. Now this can be as simple and as little as hearting the comments. Only creators can do this. So it notifies the commenter that they received a heart from the creator. And it's kind of like a receipt that you, the creator, actually physically read that comment. I'm gonna be honest, I pretty much heart every single comment that I read because I'm the only one who can do that. Anybody can like a comment, but only the creator can heart it. Now, obviously replying to comments is the best option because it represents a direct connection between the creator and the viewer. And there are two tiers at which this is typically done. The first is the stock answer. Over time, you will get a little bit bored of saying thanks in as many different ways as possible. And YouTube does provide these hot responses, but also vidIQ has a tool which allows you to add template responses, which not only can answer the typical thanks style of comments, but if you get many of the same type of question on your channel, you can use stock answers for that as well. And the best thing about that tool is that it's completely free and I've been using it for years to respond to literally thousands of comments. And then finally, of course, we have the personal and dedicated response by the creator themselves. Yes, I understand that every time you reply to a comment, it takes dedicated time, energy, and thought. Just remember this, every single person who comments on one of your videos is going through that exact same process. And it feels good, doesn't it, when people comment on your videos, because it shows that they care. So just imagine how a commenter feels when the creator themselves replies to one of their comments. They'll feel pretty good about themselves, valued, and have a direct connection to the person they are watching. So maybe we should all follow Brandon Coe's lead. Let's go put in the work. Now I know this is not easy to scale. The bigger your channel gets, the harder and harder it is to reply to every single comment. So unless you're gonna bring people in to respond to all of your comments on your behalf, just do what you can. Dedicate half an hour, an hour, whatever you can afford, because it's really gonna make a huge difference to your community. And if you're a small creator struggling to get any comments, make sure to directly engage with viewers in the first minute of a video. I mean, take this as an example. Why does it have so many more comments than usual? Well, it's because I did this. I still read and reply to as many comments as I can in the first couple of hours after a video goes live. I'm probably doing that right now if you're one of the first to watch this video. So go on, test me. And boy, did you test me. I received literally hundreds of comments that just wanted to see if I would reply to their comments as the test. But because I had made that commitment to the community, that's exactly what I did for about six hours. But it was a cool, fun, little interactive moment with the viewers, and many of them even replied to my comment, which was awesome. But let me stress, here and now, I'm not doing that again. Yes, I will be reading some of your comments. Yes, I will be replying to some of them, but not all of them. Now, it doesn't have to be as crazy as anything I did in that video. Think about how you can actively engage with your audience in the first 30 seconds to a minute. The mistake most creators make is waiting to ask questions at the end of a video. Also on the topic of comments, can I just give a shout out to all of those people who go out and try to find the vidIQ videos while they're unlisted? Because those are the true fans. And sometimes they actually help me by telling me that I forgot to add end screens to my videos. You know who you are. 
I love you. Okay, let's move on to tracking the performance of your videos, which you should get into the habit of doing, particularly in the first 24 hours. Now, naturally, the more videos you publish, the more you'll start to get a feel, a natural instinct as to how your videos generally perform. This benchmarking can be as simple as using the latest video performance card that's available on both a desktop YouTube studio and in the mobile app. 30 minutes after a video goes live, it will rank its view performance against your last 10 videos. Now at this stage, it's probably a little too early to make assumptions about the video specifically, but it might give you an indication as to whether the video topic resonates with your audience. That first hour or so is when notifications are being sent out to subscribers and regular viewers are starting to see your thumbnail on their homepage. But it's after three hours when things get really interesting because it's at this point that you'll get to see a click-through rate and average view duration. Very generally speaking, these are the two metrics YouTube suggests you improve, as this will lead to YouTube recommending your content more often, which means more impressions. But having said that, let me stress a really important point. There is no magic number when it comes to click-through rate and average view duration. Of course, the higher the better in both circumstances, but it's all relative to your YouTube channel. To give you an example, I'm going through a deep dive exercise at the moment, tracking click-through rate for the first 24 hours of a video's life. And what I'm learning is that a good click-through rate for the vidIQ channel is above 12% after one hour. You can do this type of thing for any video by setting its time period to the first 24 hours, and it will break down most metrics to the hour, in some cases almost to the minute. So what I'm doing is tracking the numbers to see what patterns I can see, but you don't have to go into such fine detail if you don't want to. From the video performance card, YouTube will do some very simple benchmarking for you through these icons, and you can even mouse over them to display typical ranges for the metric in question or a brief explanation from YouTube as to what it means. If you go into the analytics for a specific video, you can see exactly what traffic source is sending you views and again how they benchmark against your typical performance. Things to consider when benchmarking these numbers. As I said, it's all going to be relative to your channel. 12% click-through rate after the first hour might be terrible for you or fantastic for you. This can depend on a couple of things. When you're a smaller channel and YouTube is a bit more stingy with those impressions, it can be that your click-through rate is a lot higher. And then, as you find success with your content, YouTube will share it out to a broad audience who maybe isn't as invested in your content, so click-through rate can lower. For example, if your impressions suddenly skyrocket along with views, but your click-through rate plummets, that's not a bad thing. This is an example of YouTube's recommendation recommendation system, otherwise known as the algorithm, taking successful content and sharing it with new audiences. You also have to consider the competition your video is up against, which can again affect click-through rate. The more videos there are on a certain topic, the more choice a viewer has. So generally speaking, click-through rates are going to be lower all across the board for that video topic. But if there are more videos on a topic, then that topic is likely to be more popular right now, or at least trending, which means that you'll get more impressions because more people want to watch videos on that topic. As I say, click-through rates can be very hard to pin down because of both viewer intent and creator intent. We'll come back onto that a little later. And then we have audience view duration, which can be massively influenced by video length. While there is some value to telling you what the average view duration is on your channel, it can mean very different things depending on whether the video is three minutes long or 10 minutes long, which is why I recommend you return to the video analytics page 48 hours after a video goes live for two reasons. First of all, you may see these statements from YouTube, which try to translate numbers into words, which can be really Really useful if you're not a data person. And then we have audience retention. This is one of the strongest indicators of viewer satisfaction. Now again, just like click-through rate, there is no magic number when it comes to average view duration, be it 30%, 50%, 70%. But what you can do is benchmark against not only yourself, but YouTube as a whole. You will know if you are making more watchable content because you can compare the performance of individual videos against the typical retention of videos on your channel. This is a good example of where I am improving against myself. But what about my competition? Well, if I click into the audience retention data, I can set the metric by relative retention, which now compares your videos against videos of a similar length all across YouTube. So in theory, since my video performs mostly above average, the recommendation system is likely to favor my video more than others for that particular video topic, if there's demand for it. Basically, this YouTube data 
never lies. And it will tell you this information without compassion, which sometimes you need hard truths when you're emotionally attached to something. I learned this a hard way recently when I dug into my audience retention analytics to discover just how damaging branded intros can be. I mean, take a look at this. On this occasion, the branded vidIQ intro cost me nearly a quarter of the entire viewing audience in six seconds. That was an analytical slap in the face and that's why I don't use intros anymore. Now, of course, improving audience view duration is going to impact your future videos. Is there anything you can do with a video that's actually gone live? Well, you could go into the built-in YouTube editor and trim out all of the bits that are really hurting your video, but it may lose a bit of context. So what you probably wanna focus on is click-through rate. And the things that obviously impact click-through rate the most are thumbnails and titles. You can change the entire messaging, the sales pitch of a video, through those two sources of optimization. So don't be afraid to start tinkering with your thumbnail and your title. If you have that instinct that tells you very, very quickly that the video is not performing as you expect it to. Now, of course, it is much better if you have all of this already planned out in advance with five alternative titles and five alternative thumbnails. Which is why it's good practice to make the title and the thumbnail of a video before you even record it. If the video is already two hours old and you're just throwing Hail Marys making up titles and thumbnails on the spot, there is a much lower chance of them succeeding. To sum all of this up, the last thing you should do when you publish a YouTube video is absolutely nothing. Whether you're making changes to the videos that have just gone live or you're analyzing the performance of them to help improve future content, be proactive. And another thing to keep in mind, not all videos are created equal when it comes to intent. So again, try to develop an instinct for creator expectations and viewer expectations. If you're jumping on a trend that needs to succeed in the first 24 hours, it needs to perform well in browse traffic. That thumbnail has really got to grab somebody's attention and earn the click. On the other hand, you may be making content that you expect to perform just as well today as it does in a year's time because it's search driven content. This might mean that you need to exercise more patience and not make knee jerk reactions to the video as it slow burns its way through the recommendation system and into the search rankings. All right, and so you've been reading and replying to comments, you've been tracking the performance of the video. What else can you do? Promote your video. If you have 500 YouTube subscribers, obviously one way to promote your content is the community tab, but don't just re-share the video. People on the YouTube app see more than enough videos auto-playing, so make this share an experience in itself. And what I mean by this is integrating the video into some form of interactive experience, be it a question or a voting poll. The goal here is to stop the swipe, to get the user to think about the community post itself and entice them into the idea that the video link contained within that community post may resolve the question or the voting poll itself. And I would follow a similar strategy, no matter where you decide to share the video, be it on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. If you share a YouTube video on another social media platform, it's gonna to feel too much like an advert unless you already have a well-established audience on that platform. Make the share, in itself an experience the user can engage on whether or not they decide to watch the YouTube video. It's hard enough moving users from one platform to another, so at least give them some value on the platform they are currently on. And when it comes to promotion, especially with the YouTube community tab, it's probably best to do it a couple of days after the video has actually been published. It may be that the first time around your audience simply didn't see the video, and in the meantime, a lot of other video content has cluttered their subscription and home feed. So if you promote your content, a couple of days after, it feels more like a gentle tap on the shoulder. Just to remind you, did you see this video? Go check it out. Now then, whilst you're doing all of these things, replying, reading comments, tracking the progress of that video and promoting it, at the forefront of your mind, you should be asking yourself, what's next? The last thing you should be doing is just sitting there and waiting for something to happen. Either continue to refine the video you've just launched or start the next one. Certainly in my YouTube experience, you have to be able to compartmentalize each and every video, which allows you to focus on the next one because YouTube is relentless. That recommendation system, the algorithm, always wants more because once you satisfy your audience, 
they demand more. If that video you've just published is a one of 10, well, it's pretty simple what you do next. Double down, make more similar content. If you're making a series of videos that are creating binge watch sessions, then continue to complete that series. You want as many viewers as possible watching one of your videos, being satisfied by it, and then moving on to the next one that YouTube recommends from your channel. And on the flip side, if your latest video is a 10 of 10, then you know what your audience doesn't want to watch next. Much of what we're talking about here is channel focus and consistency. And if you are this deep into this video, then you've heard us talk about this many times before. I believe this is one of the reasons why vidIQ is as successful as it is with the million subscriber play button that I still haven't opened as of time of recording. Yeah, the tension is unbearable, but I'm saving myself for a live stream. I always preach to myself and any creator who asks for my advice, nothing beats experience. You make one video, you learn from it, you move on to the next and you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Be relentless. But of course, and just as importantly, you do all of this within the limits of your own mental health. Now let's think a little longer term. What should you do with your videos a week, a month, even a year after they've been published? Let me give you one of vidIQ's best examples. At the beginning of 2020, Dan published a video on how to start a gaming channel and that did phenomenally well, a million views. And so we thought to ourselves, why don't we refresh this for 2021? And so we did. And guess what? It's got a million views as well. So can you guess what we're going to do at the beginning of 2022? There is also always a potential for videos to be rescued if the content is still valuable and relevant today. A good indicator of this might be that the video has very good average view duration. So when people get into the video, they enjoy watching it, but they just can't get past the thumbnail and the title and the click through rate is low. In that instance, you can refresh the video with a brand new title and thumbnail. It may be that in the time since the video was published, you have significantly increased your title skills, your thumbnail designs, your general messaging of video. In this particular example you see on screen, what we decided to do after six months was to simply abandon our thumbnail title strategy and pretty much copy the one that was ranking at the top of the search terms and lo and behold, the performance of that video increased. Yep, sometimes if you can't beat them, just copy them. Now, of course, there will be occasions where you have to just let a video go. Yes, you may put in a lot of time and effort and resources into it, but for whatever reason, the audience simply doesn't want to watch that content. Sometimes it's just better to remake that video. As again, you've probably likely learned lots of new things and skills and information about that video topic, which is going to be better for your audience as you are a better video creator. That's why Dan is going to be remaking this how to start a gaming channel in 2022. He has learned so much over the course of 12 months and he wants to share it with all of you, if you're a gamer, of course. Over the passage of time, as a video does get older, it becomes less and less likely that you're going to be able to re-energize it with a change to the thumbnail and the title. Usually, this is just down to the relevancy of the content. Yeah, all right, the iPhone 13 may have been trending when you launched a video, but in three or four months time, when you try and change things up, there's likely much less demand for that type of content. So no matter what you do, it's simply not going to be watched. So if you are going to dedicate some time in trying to rescue an older video, make sure to do the research first to find out whether the content is still relevant. This will usually mean that you're trying to increase search traffic on a video because the content is evergreen. How to change a tire, no matter when you made the video, is just as relevant today as it was five or 10 years ago. Recently in another video, I talked about front loading your efforts. That would be dedicating 50% of your time, energy and resources or more to that title, thumbnail and video intro. And I still stand by that advice because I believe it has the most potential impact on your video the moment it's launched. What I'm encouraging you to do here is almost duplicate those efforts so that in the first 24, 48, 72 hours, you can quickly switch in the titles and the thumbnails if you think your video has a better chance with alternative offerings to your audience. That was a pretty deep dive into all of the things you should be considering and doing when you publish a video on YouTube. But what about that crucial moment just before? the upload process. Well, it just so happens we've got an in-depth video on that too, which you can check out over here. But I know some of you don't care right now. All you're interested in 
is the missing box. Go on then. Blimey, that's big.